Well, good morning to all of you. Um, it's such an honour to be seated here with, with you guys and, and the fact that you have given up your time, you know, precious time, and no on Fridays, it's day off for you, but you've chosen to be here. But I do hope that this is going to be worthy of your time. Now, before I introduce myself, I have a tendency to speak fast. So if, if I do, tell me to slow down. <laughs> Don't be apprehensive. So I said, my name is Unati Pigoletundrana. Originally, I'm, I'm from South Africa. I was born and bred there. Um, but I've literally spent most of my adult life in the United Kingdom. I um, first read um, my first degree in English and psychology. And then I did a postgrad in psychology. And um, that was not aligned for me. So I ended up teaching psychology rather than practicing it. And then I, all of a sudden, thought I needed to go back to school. And I was very fascinated by the movement of, of, of gender, gender identities and studies since I was a child. Um, so I then took a sabbatical and I went to the School of Oriental and African Studies, which is part of the University of London, where I read feminist philosophy. I thought I was going to read gender studies. But then, you know, my ignition of philosophy, which I did read initially at university, but not majored in, it was inflated. And I read, um, I was very enthused by the writings of Jacques Derrida, Jacques Lacan, um, Lucie Rigueret, Julia Kristeva, Simone de Beauvoir. And it was all within language, the philosophy of language and identity that I became engraved in. I wanted to do a PhD in the interrogation of gender and identities within the Xhosa people of South Africa, which is my tribe. But because there are no writings in that part of history, and we can all find the reasons for that within the post-colonial discourse, that we couldn't be given that space to write our own philosophies. I ended up working in schools, um, um, delivering philosophy for children. I trained. And I practice it. And then one day there was an invite to attend um, a Socratic dialogue. I had never heard of it. What is a Socratic dialogue? Uh, the institution I was working for paid for, for my attendance. I attended it and I fell in love because for the first time I found space where we can, as human beings, authentically interrogate ethics our stand in ethics, but also to listen to others critically of what today's ethics are. Because the, way, the world is changing. Everything is nothing stagnant. And every day we have to revisit our morality and the relationship between us and humanity. So I'm here then to give you an introduction of that, of what Socratic dialogue is. And hopefully we'll have, during our workshop this afternoon, you can have a feel of the whole process of what it entails, and then eventually we can talk about the logistics of way forward as, as a team. Right. So, we all have heard of the concept philosophy in action. So this is a growing movement in the School of Philosophy. So using the powerful tools of philosophical reasoning, the practitioners take on the most pressing and difficult questions from the complex personal choices faced by ordinary individuals, you and I, in our everyday lives, to the extreme major social controversies that define our time. And I'm sure, very certain, we won't be short of finding those major social controversies that are going on in the world today, like the global warming, like gender-based violence, like um, racial injustices. So through these practices, we interrogate those and we try and find as a, as a team collectively our ethical stance, which hopefully will help create healthy policies around these social issues. Now, philosophy in action can take form, um, it can be practiced by Socratic dialogue facilitators, which is what I did. I trained and, and qualified with the Society for the Furtherance of Critical Philosophy. And I'm now a candidate for the elite club, which is the GSP in Germany. Um, it's my final year. I'll be the first Brit 
to be a member of that and I'm very proud that we've made a mark and hopefully you guys can join us. We can have people from Spain. Um, you can have um, a philosophy for children and the youth facilitators where I started. And dilemma moderators. So philosophy in action can take as far as I'm aware, but I'm certain there are a plethora of forms. But these are the ones that I'm personally interested in. So Socratic dialogue. So what are we going to do during our lecture is to go back and look at the history of Socratic dialogue. And we want to trace it back to Leonard Nelson's um, theory of, of pedagogy. Then we're going to move on to contemporary critical ethical issues in the practice of Socratic dialogue. That is my own personal opinion, and that's something that has brought me here, and that's the reason why I'm going all over Europe and all over the world sharing this. And we'll have a workshop on the practical application of a Socratic dialogue. So, the history of Socratic dialogue. We have the, pol the Political Philosophy Academy, which is pronounced as the Philosophic Politische Academy, the PPA, in Germany. The PPA is dedicated to the promotion of critical philosophy in the tradition of Immanuel Kant, Jakob Friedrich Freis, and Leonard Nelson, as well as to the application of ethics, political philosophy, and philosophy of law to social, political, as espoused by Nelson, um, social and political life rather, as espoused by Nelson and his followers. So the PPA, in his writings, Leonard Nelson was mainly concerned with the epistemology, ethics, pedagogy and politics. In all three fields, he tried to put his theories into practice. Leonard Nelson was an ethical socialist. He adopted Socrates' method of searching for truth by developing the neo-Socratic method for group work. Finally, he founded the PPA to further develop and promote his philosophical ideas. So he's the founder of the Political Philosophy Academy in Germany. So the Political Philosophy Academy was founded in 1922. The PPA was, of course, banned by the Nazis, but was re-established in 1949 because it was an underground movement that was created by philosophers who were spreading the, the, the gospel of ethics and morality to people of Germany to awaken them to the unethical existence of the Nazi era. So we have the PPA, the Political Philosophy Academy. We also have in Germany the Society of Socrat Socratic Facilitators. I don't want to insult the Germans by misreading that name, but it's, it's abbreviated as the GSP. So the GSP's purpose is to develop the practice of Socratic dialogue to contribute to the theoretical tradition of Leonard Nelson and now Gustav Heckman. And now we have the Society for the Furtherance of Critical Philosophy in England. So first was the PPA, and then another movement grew from the PPA. Gustav Heckman was in love with the work of N Leonard Nelson, and he wanted to develop the work further. So he formed the Society of Socr Socratic Facilitators, and the two, the PPA, formed a union. Now, as well, the Nazis discovered that these movements were happening and people's lives were at threat, so they escaped Germany and they became, came to England as refugees. And in England, that's where then the Society for the Furtherance of Critical Philosophy was formed. It was a way where we, we rescued the, 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 the refugees um, who were philosophers from Germany and we had our own branch. So the three are together. And we also now have joined hands with the Neo-Socratic movement in Prague, where I do facilitate with um, students from Prague University, from Charles University. And we are hoping that we can grow a foundation here in Spain, you know, so we can have many bodies and connect us Europeans, you know, with a very conscious movement. Um, so we, what are we going to do today? We're going to trace the beginnings of the Socratic method 
by looking at uh, Leonard Nelson's pedagogy. He wrote a brilliant essay, lovely theory on what pedagogy should mean. So I'm going to take us a little bit back there. Well, Leonard Nelson's pedagogy. Remember, he's the founder of the Political Philosophical Academy. Leonard Nelson's Philosophical Pedagogy, which was published after his death in the volume, in the volume called Systems of Philosophical Ethics and Pedagogy, is one of four studies which, because of their titles, might be called Nelson's System Writings. Specifically so, because these are the system of philosophical ethics and pedagogy, and the system of philosophical jurisprudence and politics. First, Nelson found an epistemological basis for his thinking in the epistemology of Jacob Friedrich Fries, which he changed slightly. Motivated by Fries, so the Fries-Nelson line of theory sees an unchanging standard of the primary knowledge of reason, which can be brought to clarity by means of regressive abstraction and deduction. And these two, regressive abstraction and deducting, are the core pillars of a Socratic dialogue experience. Abstraction, which means thought, is supposed to reveal in a regressive or traditional way, the basic judgments that underlie everyday judgment. The basic judgments that underlie everyday judgments. Deduction, on the other hand, encourages participants to form basic judgments that are rigidly founded in a sense of truth basic judgments that are rigidly founded in a sense of truth. So we have deduction and truth, and we have abstraction and um, uh, regressive um, abstraction, which is a way of the basic judgments that underlie every judgment. On this epistemological basis, Nelson elaborates his main ethical work, which was called The Critique of Practical Reason. In the critique of practical reason, the subject matter of ethics is decisively expanded beyond Kant's position. Nelson observes doctrine of duties, doctrine of duties as being grounded in a moral law and the doctrine of ideals. So if doctrine, the doctrine of duties grounded in moral law, which can be very rigid and very stagnant in its origin, and the doctrine of ideals. He argues, the fulfillment of the requirements of duty is morality, and the fulfillment of the ideal is education. So that's where we see the marriage coming in of morality, ethics, and education. Nelson first characterized the term pedagogy, which is education, very generally as everything that amounts to a certain shaping of the personality. The shaping of the personality through education can only be provided by ethics. So I've come to term this ethical pedagogy. Ethical pedagogy must be founded, and this is my ideal, ethical pedagogy must be founded in the ideals of the love of humanity, the love of justice, and love of truth. It is my belief that every academic institution, from nursery to university, should strive to produce individuals that are not only ethically, eth ethically rather, oriented, 
but those who have significant knowledge, passion, on the role the practice of ethics plays in the preservation of humanity and nature. I, it is my belief that it should be mandatory, and not only should we empower young people of the knowledge and wisdom and the epistemology of ethics, but also we need to drive within them the passion of constantly, constantly interrogating every day's ethics because the world is not stagnant. And this can be always done through the practice of Socratic dialogue. What could have been ethical 10 years ago may not be so these days, and we have seen such. So here we have. We have morality, gives birth to ethics and humanity, and that's the cycle that um, the movement is based on. Morality, ethics, humanity, and how these come together through the Socratic dialogue experience. Now, here we are, we have morality, we have ethics, we have humanity, and we have Socratic dialogue. How we can use Socratic dialogue to interrogate and invigorate our passion for the application of moral standards and the practices of morality amongst us humans and the environment in which we live in. How Socratic dialogue can help us interrogate our understanding and practices of ethics in our day-to-day -day lives, at work, at home, family, relations with our friends, our husbands, wives, brothers and sisters. And all those come together for one common purpose, and that is the preservation of humanity, if there is still some left. <laughs> That's the question. Now, this brings me to the reason why I'm here. So that is my stance. Contemporary ethical, I mean critical ethical issues in the practice of Socratic dialogue, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing and visiting university students as much as I can. Now, we can tell by the numbers, you know, there's very few of us because Socratic dialogue is not something that is popularly known. But it is one of those growing, emerging careers, um, which is being absolutely exploited, in my view, by those who have qualified to become Socratic Dialogue facilitators. Now, we have heard in the past how companies, corporates like Mercedes-Benz, Volkswagen, Siemens, and many other companies that have not been probably globally published, who are being sued and made to pay billions and billions of dollars fined for break breaking ethical codes. So what these companies are doing now, and most companies, they're inviting Socratic dialogue facilitators to come into their practices and to assist in the interrogation of ethics within their policies. And not only do they help to interrogate the presence or absence of ethics in, 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 in their policies, but they also assist or facilitate in the creation of new ethical policies, ethical viewpoints on policies and most importantly, thus um, enabling employers to willingly comply. We've heard of compliance, but compliance can be very difficult if the policies are shoved from top down. Compliance is practical and enduring when people have been engaged in the construction of those policies. So because there isn't many of us in the field, companies Socratic dialogue facilitators can charge up to 14,000 euros a day, which I find very unethical. 14,000, you're going to a place, an institution, to help people practice ethical conduct, and you're going there being unethical and taking that much worth of money a day. Yes, that is possible, because there's very few of them, and they're in demand. Um, there are other people who've qualified as Socratic dialogue facilitators who are now ripping off people and charging them over 3,000 euros for a three-day training. 
And I can tell you, you can never walk out of a three-day training as a qualified Socratic dialogue facilitator. You can never. It takes time. You need to be a participant for quite a lengthy period of time to master the, the, the craft and the art of the Socratic method. So I am here because I would like to have, hopefully, as many young people from different schools of thought, whether it's law, philosophy, medicine, because we need facilitators in our schools of thought. The legal system is corrupt as it is. The political institutions are corrupt as they are. So it is my wish that you get this training for nothing. Enjoy the experience of the Socratic experience and hopefully train to qualify to become Socratic dialogue facilitators where we can start through the university spreading the good word within institutions like whether it's a municipality, whether it's um, corporate companies, but I just really am quite grieved by the fact that, you know, because there's few of us, people can charge these amounts of money. So, I trained through the Society for the Furtherance of Critical Philosophy. I didn't have to pay a penny for my training. All I did was to pay for my transportation and my accommodation. That's the, the ethical practice of the Socratic experience. So because I am trained, it is my duty to help others being trained and hopefully this can grow in Spain and you can have your own society and you, the five of you would have started it. That's my hope. Now, there's another model, my professor Boris Schweitzer, he has his own model. So Boris, he's, he's a Leonard Nelson um, fan, who's my principal supervisor in my PhD. He's read Nelson, he's an expert in Nelson. And he differs with um, the traditional way Nelson um, uh, introduced Socratic dialogue, that there should be a facilitator and there should be participants. Now, Boris thinks that that creates a kind of hierarchy within the setting. Well, you have somebody who's a facilitator and it's already there. I mean, I've, I've been doing Socratic dialogues for years. The, being in a Socratic dialogue and you have the facilitator, everyone, you, you think of them as being very highly because, oh, they've trained and they've mastered the craft and they should facilitate us. And there's, there's that kind of aura. Boris doesn't want that to be. He wants all of us to train to facilitate our own dialogues. So if we could have a Socratic dialogue, there wouldn't be a, a facilitator, but we'd all facilitate the dialogue through two things. Critical listening listening to one another critically, and critical thinking, joining our thoughts with the other person's thoughts. So we can move it that way, and also the, the importance of acknowledging space that we share. No one has to put their hand up to speak. We can just use our body language and observe and give everybody space to express their own views. So this is what my professor wants to see happen in the universities that we're working with. So I have your lovely university, and I have uh, King's College, one of the Russell Group, and now the movement is growing in London. We have UCL wanting to join in. We have SOAS, my former university, wanting to join in. I'm very, very tempted to say no to them, <laughs> but I have to get them on board, because that's unethical. Um, so we have um, also, um, so it's, it's, oh, also the, I think it's, um, I've forgotten the third university, but it's growing. The movement is growing in London and they really want to join hands with you. They really want to join hands. We're hoping to get a response from up north in, in Denmark, but we haven't had a response yet. But I'll be going to Venice next week, to the University of Venice, next month rather, to talk to them so we can have at least, um, we have um, Germany, TU Darmstadt University, we have University of Valencia, University of Venice, and all the London universities. So we have this growing movement, and hopefully um, we'll grow even beyond then. It would be nice to take it to other countries that are, are quite deprived as well. Now, Socratic dialogue. You let me know when you want a break. Are we still okay with attention, concentration? Okay, you're better than me, so that because you're younger than me. I'm quite an old woman, believe you me, very old. My attention span is quite limited. Um, 
So Socratic dialogue. There is a basic assumption behind the practices of Socratic dialogue. Namely, that it is worth our while to talk about the most important things about how we ought to live. This is by Fernando Leo and Rene Saran and Barbara Neza in 20, 2004 in the book called Inquiring Minds, which was published by Tretham Books. It's on page 121. The Socratic method, what is it? The Socratic method encourages participants to reflect and think independently and critically. Socratic dialogue is practiced in small groups with the help of a facilitator so that self-confidence in one's own thinking is enhanced and the search for truth in answer to a particular question is undertaken in common. The search for truth. Not, we're not searching for consensus. We don't have to always agree with one another. But we can always agree on the truth. What is the truth in this statement? Where can we find the truth in this question? So, no prior philosophical training is needed. Provided the participants are motivated to try the method and are willing to contribute their honest thoughts and to listen to those of others. Now, I think we may all be aware that the School of Philosophy is very often considered as the elite school. Great thinkers, you must be very intelligent. And when people hear the name or the word philosophy, mm, no, I can't do that, you know, that must be... No, 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 no. The, the reason why we're encouraging those who are not trained in philosophy to join along is because every human being is born a philosopher. We think, we analyse, we listen. We analyze. So every human being is a philosopher. We're constantly critically analyzing what we hear, what we see, what we think. So honesty is very important in a Socratic setting. You just don't disagree with somebody because you don't like them. You disagree because you have the ethical um, um, backing behind it, which is not personal. It has to be um, objective, not subjective. Well, the questions drawn mainly from ethics, politics, epistemology, and mathemat mathematics are of a general and fundamental nature. So, take for instance, I conducted a Socratic dialogue for five days. Five days we're interrogating the question, when is it right to disagree? Can you imagine that? And when the five days was over, I was facilitating that dialogue, people were like, it's not enough time, we need more days to interrogate. When is it right to disagree? So we have lovely questions like, um, when should I judge others? What makes a good citizen? What are the limits of my responsibilities for others? When is it right to say no? When should I say no? And the one I like the most, when is it right to not, tell, to, not to tell the truth? <laughs> when is it all right not to tell the truth? Not to lie, but not to tell the truth. Because we always live under this pseudo, like, we always have to tell the truth. Do we really always have to? Other circumstances when we cannot tell the truth. We can only find these from concrete experiences when people share their personal stories where they made judgments that in that particular instant, it was justified for them not to tell the truth. I'll give an example. I went to Black Historic University in South Africa, which was very politically charged. Um, Nelson Mandela was the chancellor. That was the first job he got when he left prison. Came straight to my university, because the university was very political and it produced one of the best 
that time of politicians. I don't know what's happening now with corruption, but here we go. And we had so many political students in my university. It's the same university my parents went to. It was pride to go to the University of the North. Um, therefore, there was a time when our university's sports grounds were used as a campsite for the South African Defence Force, South African Police Services, and the Boer Police Services. And that's one of my universities where we had so many massacres. So when police would come and kill students, the army would um, abduct students, and they disappeared and they've never been traced back. Um, a lot of atrocities went through there in, in, in our time. So, we'd have the army knock at our doors at midnight with machine guns. Where is so-and-so? We want him. I knew where so-and-so was, but I could not tell the truth. So those are the circumstances when it is justified not to tell the truth. So then we do away with this presupposition that you must always tell the truth. No, there are sometimes ethical grounds where it is justified not to tell the truth. That's my opinion, maybe you may disagree with me, <laughs> but I would judge that. If I would tell the, the services where the person is knowing that that could be the end of his life, then I shouldn't be telling the truth in that particular instance. So, going back, so we, our questions are drawn from ethics, as I was saying, but also epistemology, like what is courage? What is law? What is truth? What is a lie? What is pedagogy? What is justice? What is injustice? And also mathematical Socratic dialogues. Now, I've never attended one. I'm off to Helsinki in May to attend one. But you in, we interrogate a, um, a triangle, <laughs> philosophically, for six days. What is this? What could it be? What could it be not? Could be a number. It could be a, what do we call this? Um, 10.5, what is the point there? <laughs> what does it mean? So we all philosophically engage in the definition and trying to find an understanding of what things are and not are. I would really encourage people to do a mathematical dialogue. I know I wasn't good in mathematics, so I know I'm going to be struggling. So, yeah, it's part of things that we do. Now, we have four indispensable features of a Socratic dialogue. We always start with the concrete, which is a personal experience. And we remain in contact with the concrete experience. So, take you through this practically during our, our um, work, workshop. But we, we may investigate the question, when is it right to disagree? So we are participants in a Socratic dialogue, all of us in this room, and every one of us is going to give an example when they felt it was right to disagree. And then as a group, we choose the example that we know will help us to authentically investigate the truth of this question, the answer to this question. So insight, so the concrete experience, which is a personal experience that you lived, insight is gained only when all, when, when all phases of a Socratic dialogue, the link between any statement made and personal experience is explicit. It's out there. Whatever statements we make in our dialogue, they should be explicitly linked to the concrete example, the lived experience we have decided as a group to choose. This means that a Socratic dialogue is a process which concerns the whole person. You as an individual, your emotional being, your psychological being, your physical being. There's a lovely definition by Dr. Dieter Kohn. Second phase, so the first one, we're starting from concrete and remaining in contact with the concrete experience. The second one is full understanding between participants. Now, we're human beings. We disagree very often and all the time, and there are disagreements in a Socratic dialogue. Um, but there should be full understanding of everybody who's participating. This involves much more than verbal agreement. 
everyone has to be clear about the meaning of what has just been said by testing it against her or his own concrete experience. You must be very clear of what the other person has said. Every statement must be clear to all participants. And you should be able to test or relate the statement to your own personal experiences. The limitations of individual personal experience, which stand in the way of full understanding, should be made conscious and thereby outdone. Right. So, it's imperative that we do away with our own preconceived ideas of perceptions of certain concepts. You do away with that and you allow your mind to be fed, nurtured, nurtured by other people's thoughts. So it's very important that we're all conscious that whatever we're saying, whatever we're thinking, it is not subjective. It's not how we feel, but it's how we are learning from each other in that particular instance. And we should always outdo our own personal um, conceptions or interpretations of concepts. So the third feature is the adherence to a subsidiary question until it is answered. So. We have a question. When is it right to disagree? We need to be able to stay in line of investigating or interrogating that question until then. We cannot divert and say, oh, oh, what does right mean? That question, when is it right to disagree, is a question that we're going to be investigating. If it's five days, six days, or seven days, we're going to be investigating that, and we are going to be working towards answering. So in order to achieve the adherence to the question, the group is required to bring great commitment to their work and to gain self-confidence in the power of reason. Great commitment to your presence, your work, your thoughts. And also you must be committed to gain self-confidence in the power of reason. This means, on the one hand, not giving up when the work is difficult. Sometimes we get to a place where it's hard to think, it's hard to move on. Things are so difficult. We're not going to give up. We can give our other a break, 30 minutes or an hour, and come back. Because our ultimate goal is to come to what we call a universal statement. A new philosophy that helps to answer the question at hand. Uh, we need to be very calm, enough to accept for a time, a different course in dialogue in order then to return to the subsidiary question. So within a Socratic dialogue, which is what we call content dialogue, you'd have what we call um, a meta dialogue, where we all stop and make an evaluation. What's happening in the group? Group dynamics, are we still in line? We look at the content, what is the strategy forward? So you can have a content dialogue, um, sorry, a content dialogue is a Socratic dialogue, you can have a meta dialogue, you can have a strategic dialogue, you can have the red thread. I'll take you all through those. Um, in our workshop. So this is the last one we're going to do for now. I think we need a break. The, four indispensable, the fourth indispensable feature of a Socratic dialogue is striving for consensus. Not achieving consensus, but striving for it. Because sometimes we can sit um, for six days trying to interrogate a question and we cannot agree the final answer. We don't always have to come with the answer, but it's a, you know, it's a striving for it to come up with the answer. So this requires an honest examination of the thoughts of others and being honest to one's own statements. We can only strive for consensus if we have an honest examination of other people's thoughts and also being honest in our own statements, what we say, and also in our own thoughts. When such honesty and openness towards one's own and other participants' feelings and thinking are present, then the striving for consensus will emerge, not necessarily the consensus itself. We don't always have to agree, but we can always strive to reach an agreement. So I think, I think for now, um, I'm just gonna say that, we can just take a break. So according to Dieter Kron, the firm establishment of these four indispensable features of a Socratic dialogue tells us much about the tasks and the behaviour of those who participate in such dialogues. Now, Socratic dialogues. I hope you can see this, but I can always send you 
I can only send you a, um, a PowerPoint presentation of this. But this is how I usually work. Um, so I would normally do this at the start of a Socratic dialogue because very often um, I have new people engaging in Socratic dialogue um, for, um, experiences or participations. And sometimes it's very imperative that even those who have been participants of Socratic dialogue over a number of years are reminded of the main principles of what this dialogue is because it's completely unique. It's not in everyday setting. This is a different special platform with different principles and expectations. So, Socratic dialogue, we've always we've gone so far as identifying it as a philosophical investigation. It is based on personal experiences. Remember, we start from the concrete, that example that we choose as a group to use as our point of focus where we start off with this philosophical investigation. We share together and we listen to one another and there is no right and wrong in our statements. Everyone's statement is highly appreciated. We value it. We know Leonard Nelson is a founder. He bases his theory on philosophical truth truth, not about personal um, attitudes we have to one another or about one another, but the truth, the truth. What is the truth in this? And we only can attain the truth by asking questions and by giving honest answers. So this helps us to deconstruct presuppositions of our everyday thinking which are very detrimental and we move forward to a place where we're allowing our thoughts to be constructed ethically and morally by those of others and that's when we come in with critical listening and critical thinking right the objectives objectives of this are for us to gain a philosophical experience practical philosophical experience our own philosophy, not that of others, our philosophy. Um, we philosophize for ourselves because by being here, we are our own philosophers. We're searching for the truth. So we ask the question, where is the truth? Where is the true answer to the question? Where can we find as a group the true answer to the question we're investigating today. We aim to reach a consensus. We strive to reach a consensus. And that consensus is applicable right through the red thread of the Socratic dialogue. But we may not reach the consensus all the time. But the most important thing of practical philosophers is them striving very hard to work towards reaching a consensus. At least we can agree at the end about the truth. So that's where we look at ethics, truth of ethics, morality. What are the principles? We start from a concrete, which is our example. Um, we could have a general question or a general statement. It could be a question um, as I said, what is courage? Or we can start with the statement, courage is incomplete. We come up with examples from the participants. And we choose one example. Reaching a consensus, truth, not subjective opinions, but we're here as a collective, as a team. We need to agree on one thing. Which example is going to allow us to investigate the true answer to the question? So we choose one example. And then from that example, we go on and engage in what we call a microscopic investigation. It's literally nitty gritties. We look at everything. No stone is left unturned. We work very hard to try and understand each other's statements. So which is why, as I say, we're quite a huge international organization. So it's very common 
in a Socratic dialogue that you have people with, we bring our phones and translate, and we're very patient with one another. We don't think with our languages, we think with our minds. So the fact that we're not fluent in certain languages doesn't make us less incompetent. So we try and understand each other and we spend time trying to understand one another. So one of the things that is probably lacking in society today, we never give ourselves time to try and understand one another. And every statement is examined on how it fits in the question. How does her statement fit in the question? How does it expand our investigation? How does it take us sideways? Can we park it? Can we revisit it later? Can we form a subsidiary question from her statement? Now, the principles are all participants must contribute because it's our dialogue. Now, we contribute from the first onset. You must commit to time. Because if someone pulls out of the Socratic dialogue, the whole Socratic dialogue is finished. We don't even, if someone has to go and have a comfort break, we all stop and keep quiet. We do not say anything, because that participant is very valued. And their value is, is the key to the success of our Socratic experience. So you cannot say, I'm coming, I can only come on Friday. No, you have to commit, ethically commit to be there physically and ethically commit to contribute. And some of us are not good speakers. Some of us are better listeners than speakers. You know, and sometimes silence is a great contributory factor. So you can find somebody who's been quiet for a while and then, wow, when they speak, they've been sitting there analysing what we're doing. And then it's that statement, those statements that they make, that take our dialogue to an advanced level. So it's imperative that we are aware of space, not to dominate space, and to understand that the space is shared by everybody, and everybody is entitled to this space. So, so personal experiences versus something we have read or heard. So there is no experience better than the one we've experienced, rather than reading from other people's perspectives. Henceforth, we cannot achieve the ultimate philosophical experience in a Socratic dialogue if we use examples of people who are not present in our dialogue. We have to be honest. We have to be very honest in our questioning. We have to be very honest in our thinking. Are you asking the question with sincere honesty, with the intention of enriching our Socratic dialogue and giving us that opportunity to philosophically and, um, investigate this question. Our thinking has to be honest as well. Only genuine doubts about what has been said should be expressed. Only genuine and honest doubts about what has been said should be expressed. You don't make um, ask doubts or doubt people's statements because you don't like them or you don't get along with them. No. The subject is out. We are now a collective and we are a team moving together critically and philosophically. Um, so, every participant must participate. They must express their thoughts very clearly. We should do so so that Everyone is able to build on the ideas contributed by others. So henceforth, we're encouraging people to use translators so that their expressions of thoughts are very clear and well understood by everybody. And that everybody can contribute to your thoughts as well. And your thoughts can contribute to our own thinking. So we think before we speak. So you find out in a Socratic dialogue that there's a plethora of moments of silence. We're thinking about what the other person has said and how it relates to my own thoughts and to their thoughts. How are we finding something in common here? How can we move together in thought in our investigation? 
So everyone is listened to carefully. Is listened carefully to all contributors. Everyone is listened to carefully, but also everybody is listening carefully to all contributions. It's imperative that we are let. Henceforth, we take a lot of breaks in between. So that we have coffee breaks, comfort breaks, long lunches, so that people are refreshed and nourished and are ready to, phys to physically, emotionally, psychologically and mentally engage in the experience. So, the criteria of an example, which is something we're going to now start off with as a group. So, what is the criteria of a lived experience? The example that one needs to give before you even give that example, you need to think about what your example needs to have. Your example must be a lived experience. It must have something that is, you've experienced, something that happened or something you were part of, but you still have clear memory of it. It has to be simple. It has to be interesting. Now, it must be relevant to the question. So, when we say, when is it right to disagree, I can come with an example, very short and clear. Um, three months ago, uh, my sister telephoned me um, to tell me that we should meet up um, for lunch. She called me on Saturday morning saying, let's meet for lunch Saturday noon. I said no, because I did not have time to prepare. I disagreed with her proposal. So that's very nice and simple. I've lived it. There are other people who I was experiencing this with. And it's very simple, short and straightforward. Um, may, but mine is not interesting at the moment, but we will look at other people's interesting experiences. It is relevant to the question, when is it right to disagree? I disagreed with my sister. I said, I cannot meet you today because you did not give me enough time. And it's a closed thing. It's not something that is going to bring emotional distress, something that's going to upset me. It must be an experience that happened. You remember the details, but it's something that happened in the past and it's closed and there are no emotional, you know, sort of like connections, something that may affect you. So these are things as a group. We look into the examples and think, hmm, is it sure? Is it lived? Yes, the person lived this ex experience. Is it simple? Yeah, the simpler it is, the better, because you do not want to spend time trying to understand an example. It's short, it's simple, it's interesting, it's relevant to the question, and it's closed. There are no emotional distresses associated with it. So, example structure. It must have the five W's. Who was involved in this? First, when did this happen? Where it happened? Who? There must be I. It must be an example where you were part of the experience, not we were an example where you're observing other people doing something. No, I was in the example. I said this. I thought this. I felt this. I did this. So the, the, the you is very imperative in this example. And all those things, what you said, what you thought, what you felt, and what you did, are very imperative. Now, what happened? in this example, and why did you feel it was just for you to disagree with this person? So you come up with your own personal judgment. So, just now, within the Socratic dialogue, where we are writing things on notes, on our flip charts, and we're putting them around, so we can see the trajectory of our content dialogue, there's what we call a meta-dialogue. It's all about reflections. How is the atmosphere? Is it friendly? Is it tense? Is it rigid? You know, are the people uncomfortable about a certain thing? This one is not facilitated by a Socratic dialogue facilitator. It's facilitated by a volunteer of the participants. So that's the time when you actually also look into me as a facilitator. Are there things that I could be improving to make it better? Because this is your dialogue at the end of the day. I'm just here as an, uh, uh, you know, silent presence or an invisible presence. But this is your dialogue. So we look at this um, facilitator, um, what are we doing as a group? Are there people, because sometimes things get tense in a Socratic dialogue. And then we see fractions happening in groups, <laughs> do you understand? And that's not supposed to happen. We're supposed to be pulling through together. So are there people speaking more than others? Are there others who are not participating more? What can we do to make sure that everyone has that space? Are we friendly? 
the content, how is the content going so far? Are we moving towards investigating this question and trying to find the truth in this answer? And then method, what method can we use next to move forward? So we also have strategic, strategic dialogues, um, which is basically, it's another dialogue we can have within a Socratic dialogue. Okay, here we are. Um, is it general sort of like look into what we've used so far and what has worked so far? What would be the best way to move forward? So both meta and strategic dialogues can be requested whenever needed by the participants. You can say, right, I need a meta dialogue now. I'm lost. I don't understand what we're doing right now. I'm lost in thought. And it's our duty as a collective to help you bring you back to where we are. And you can ask for it any time. The final one is the red thread. So we look at the content dialogue, at the notes, and we then scrutinize them. So do we find anything relevant to the question? Could we add some things to our content? Could we do away with other things within our content? And that is the basic structure of a Socratic dialogue. But what we're going to do now, we're going to try and think of questions we may want to investigate. I know some of you want to explore questions within um, um, what, what's this, a corporate setting. It could be questions within an academic setting. I mean, I did a fa facilitated a Socratic dialogue between um, professors, their PhD students, and their master's students on when is it right to judge others, right? And because you have that relationship with your PhD supervisor or your MA supervisor, we have to agree and, and, and disagree, and you have to be judged as a student, you know, uh, and when should we accept judgment? When is judgment incorrect? When is judgment correct? So it could be something in a, an academic se setting could be anything. So I'm just going to give you a moment for now and maybe you can jot down questions that maybe could be what is good customer service? What is ethical legal practice? What is ethical medical practice? What makes a responsible doctor? What makes a responsible student? So all of those questions you can play around and we can see what we can accumulate and then we can choose one question. And then we can see if we can find examples so you can have that experience where we start and how we move on. It's just going to be a crash course so you get the jinx of it, what we do. And then hopefully next time we'll have those three days to have a full and complete experience of a Socratic um, dialogue.